thing. It is very essential that we understand the first 11 chapters because sanctification, justification, being right with God, being saved, all of that is so, so very essential. But those are given, those are taught so that we will be able to live the way God intended for us to live. So here we are, 12th chapter. The actual purpose of the book is to bring the believer to this very point. And we started talking about this about three weeks ago, very practical section. They are foundation to the way we act, first 11 chapters. But we need to be able to act and to behave, live, talk, and think. This is the heart of the matter right now. Having laid the foundation, we come to these matters of practical living. And if you have been shouting, where is something that I can take home? Where is that something which I can live by? And if we are giving these things and you are still shouting that something is wrong, this is application at its best. Romans chapter 12 and following all the way up to chapter 16, we are given these commands on how to live practical life as a Christian. It all begins with giving ourselves to Christ, verses 1 and 2. Next, to give ourselves to the church. First is to Christ, second is to the church, and then how we are to live our Christian life, verses 9 through 21. It takes off by speaking to individual Christians, as we saw in verse 9, who is to have love without hypocrisy, as you recall, who is to hate evil and to hold fast to what is good. This is all review. And it all starts with some priorities, a sincere love, hating evil, and commitment to what is right. That is the basic fundamental thing personally. That is what we were taught. Then the instruction goes to include the Christian family. First it was to personal individuals, and then it goes out to Christian individuals as our family members. To be tenderly affectionate to other believers, to seek above all things to honor others, and concerning our service to Christ in verse 11, not to be lazy, to be hardworking, and with enthusiasm. We have commented that to be a Christian, it is a contradiction in terms to say that you are a Christian and have no energy, that you are always lazy and very out of touch, lethargic. There's no sense of passion or urgency. Do not call yourself a Christian because to be a Christian means to have that urgency and hardworking with passion and fervor. That is what a Christian ought to be. So if you are barely making it into the house of God and barely saying things like, God, please make the word of God come alive. How dare we say, please make your word come alive when it is we, we need to come alive. God's words are alive. God's words are inspired by the Holy Spirit. These words are given to us for life. And it took so much effort on the part of these authors, 40 different authors, and this has been written over 1,600 years. This book of the Bible, the Word of God, has been given to us, and that is why we are here tonight. Every time we assemble, we need to consider the words of God. Praise is important. Fellowship is important. All of the other things that's related to church is important, but we must not neglect meeting together for the purpose of learning from His Word. That is why we're here. That is why on Wednesday, middle of the week, we take time out. We would all like to rest. We would all like to just kind of kick back and watch whatever that's on television and all of that. But we are here because we love to hear from God. You've heard this pastor who loves sports, especially football, but he had an obligation, of course, to preach the Word of God. And Super Bowls always take place on Sunday. And so he was preaching in the evening worship, and he had to do both. And you saw that he had a little bit of a TV of some sort underneath him, and he was preaching away with his one eye on the TV. And when his team scored a touchdown, instead of saying, not being able to say, touchdown, he raised his arm and said, hallelujah! I don't know if he got away with that. Even though there are so many things that we could be doing, we are here for the purpose of getting instruction, learning, and how we can... Glorify God. And there's no better way to glorifying God than to be sitting and hearing God's word. When you want to show respect to somebody, an elderly, somebody that you love or honor or respect, 
and you're always looking somewhere, you're looking at your phone, you're looking at your watch, that is far from showing any kind of respect. So the best way that you can show respect to God is to sit down and listen to his word. It takes discipline, which we talked about last time. Self-discipline, it takes discipline. And we try to teach that to our little children. Adults are the same way. You might be better disciplined as an adult, but your mind can wander so, so far away. You need to bring your mind back. Not just your heart, but your mind, your body, has to be included in your total focus and concentration. As a result of that, verse 12 indicates that we need to rejoice with hope in those trials, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying, being sensitive not only to our own trials, but to others who are having trials also. So in verse 13, it says, We are to practice hospitality, ready to help those in need, even the strangers. Those are the instructions towards ourselves and the family. Tonight, we come to a third circle, if you will. It is about embracing everyone, verses 14 to 16. Here, the circle widens to discuss how we are to live in relationship to everyone. First, he talked about how we are to be as an individual. Then he goes to our Christian family. Now he wants to have us understand how to behave or have a relationship, living in relationship to everyone else. Not just Christians, but everyone else in general. So in verse 14, we read this, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. We are to live by blessing the people who treat us with evil intention. And you might have experienced this. I know I have. We have people with evil male intentions who try to treat us evil, take advantage of us. They have an evil intent, and you've experienced that all the time. We are to live by blessing the people who treat us with evil intention. If I were to ask you for a hand, every hand probably will go up. You were a victim of someone treating you, mistreating you harshly with evil intent. This is rather an old principle in Scripture. Combination of the next two places in Scripture. First, Matthew 5, 44, we read there, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Luke 6, 27 and 28, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. In other words, love your enemies, bless them that cause you evil, and do good to them that hate you. Pray for them. How unnatural this is for us. How unnatural it is to bless those who curse us. To treat with kindness those who treat us badly. Those who persecute us, we are told to pray for them. This is the kind of love that's genuine. It is a heartfelt love, not hypocritical love, not a superficial love. Continuing in that same Luke 6, verse 29 through 32, To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Verse 30, give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods. Do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Amen. Christianity is known as a positive religion, opposed to Buddhism, which is known as a negative religion, because the golden rule to a Christian is do unto others. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Buddhism says, do not. It's a negative religion in that you do not do to others what you do not want them to do to you. So therefore, you do not kill a bug or anything like that. On top of that, of course, you believe in reincarnation. Christianity is doing. It is doing positive. It is an optimistic religion, if you want to call Christianity religion. It is not a religion in that we do not dare go up to God. God comes down to us. So in that sense, it is not a religion. Every other religion in the world tries to make it to the heavens in order to 
get there, they need to please the gods of their choosing. That is why they emphasize works. They emphasize self-righteousness, which the Bible says you can never attain. Christianity is so great, even though the standards are very high, we have the main thing taken care of. Salvation is taken care of because it is impossible to be attained on our own. He gives it to us. In life, everything that is so valuable that we cannot purchase are given to us free. How much is oxygen to you? How important is oxygen to you? We cannot afford it no matter how much money we have. Therefore, God says, I'm going to give you that. And how many of us think about breathing? Okay, I'm going to have to now breathe. Okay, breathe in, breathe out. It is done automatically. Our system is built by God so that we don't have to worry about breathing, when to stop breathing. Well, when you stop breathing, you die. We just are given this ability to breathe. We don't have to even think about it. When you're first learning how to drive, everything is so difficult. You've got to watch the rear view mirror. You have to watch the side view mirror. You have to turn your shoulder, look over your shoulder right and left. You've got to signal. You have to go at a right speed. And it's just so many things to remember at the same time. But when you are a veteran driver, you could be listening to music. You could be driving one hand. You could be maybe talking to somebody on your Bluetooth. You're just like, it's easy. It's very comforting. I love driving myself. And it's just driving. You can do many things, multitask. Some of you even eat while you're driving. We don't have to think about these things when it comes to our body. Our body, do you know, when you're asleep, you don't need to go to the restroom. But the moment you wake up, what happens? Your body says, oh, I got to go to the bathroom because it knows how to shut down. It's just an amazing thing that God has given us. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do not do to them that hate you. Pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. It's very, very difficult to do this. It is unnatural. But Christianity is a positive religion. It is loving, doing, genuinely. So the most important thing has been taken care of, salvation, but the rest, our responsibility. That is why, even though we don't get saved by our works, we get sanctified. We become holy by our efforts. That is why parents try to teach children, this is the way you ought to be living your Christian life. A lot of times parents would say, do not do what I say, or do not do what I do, do what I say. And we are hypocrites ourselves as parents and as adults, but we try to teach our offspring, our children. We try to teach one another because it is so important that we take responsibility in making ourselves holy. We are holy in the sense that God has already purchased us. He has sanctified us, that we are already ready for heaven even if we were to die right now. We are holy. We are perfect in the eyes of God. But realistically speaking, we haven't gotten there. That is why God puts that responsibility squarely on the shoulders of all of us. It is our responsibility to not become lazy. It is our responsibility to read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is not going to turn the pages for you. He's not going to say all of that automatically. Even though you and I might be praying about a supernatural phenomenon to take place, God, just make me holy. Why don't you just help me? Do everything for me. I'm just not going to do anything. You do it. Like If you want to exercise, you're the one who has to get up, put on your shoes, and get out there and walk or jog or sprint or whatever you need to do. Go out to a gym, do it. You could be saying, I wish I could work out. But if you're sitting down and asking God to do it, nothing will ever happen. There are some things that God does. He takes care of the most important things. But the rest, he says, hey, it is your responsibility to these things. So if you find living a Christian life a hard thing to do, Obviously, it is not easy. It takes self-discipline is what we said. And I'm not going to repeat what I said concerning self-discipline, but you need to start with small things and then tackle those kinds of things that God requires you to do. The world is going to respond to goodness with goodness. The world is going to respond to goodness with goodness, to respond to love with love. But our distinctiveness need to love to those who hate us. That's what makes Christians different. If you love only those who love you, you're no different. You need to love those that do not love you, those that hate you, with goodness to those who do evil. 
the ones who come against you to pursue someone with the intent of doing harm. We need to pursue those who do wrong to us. We need to show love. Again, not a natural thing for us to do. We want to punch them back. We want to retaliate. There was one time I was driving, and apparently I cut in front of him. I had no idea I did. He stopped behind me and even came near me. And first he rolled down the window and said some beautiful comments. And then he came out of his car and wanted to smash the window and do something. And, of course, I don't know what I did, but said sorry if I did anything and went on my way. And later on, when I told that story, people asked, I know you're a pastor, but why didn't you fight back? It was so big. (laughs) But even if it was small... (laughs) Our job, our method, or our equation for whether to retaliate or not is not based on someone's stature, physical appearance. We do it because this is what separates Christians. That is our distinctiveness. It says, bless them, desiring that God would pour out his goodness His grace, His mercy. It is what Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And it is the spirit of Stephen who laying beneath the bloody stones that are crushing out his life, he looks to heaven in Acts 7 verse 60, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he has said this, he fell asleep. Just before he passed, with the rocks and stones that were crushing his body, he looked to heaven and he blessed those who were killing him. Bless is in a present tense. It is the idea of constantly blessing, not just one time mixed with evil. It is not blessing somebody with all kinds of hatred mixed, but it is a pure Love and blessing, a constant blessing. To bless means to celebrate with praise, to wish God's will. Again, such an unnatural reaction. We would like to turn the other cheek just so that we can turn around to pow them back. We don't have any inklings of blessing those who hurt us. We don't do that to our loved ones. Our spouse may say something that's out of line. We don't take that in. We are right quick to say, that's not true. If we do this to our loved ones, to our spouses, to our children, to our parents, to our siblings, to our parents, certainly when somebody that we have no connection to do us bad, Some of you are very good at retaliation. Some of you are very good at fighting back. Some of you may be quiet normally, but when they attack you, especially your loved ones, all of a sudden you start speaking in tongues. You're like 50 miles per hour in your speech, much, much faster than your normal speech. And how you can get out of all the sentences just as a wonder. A lot of times I try to say something and I lose words and I go home regret. How come you are not able to articulate your thoughts? But I said over the years, I would rather regret for not expressing myself rather than saying something, blurting something without really thinking and then hurting that person, something that I regret. That would be something more regrettable. That is the way that I have lived my life. And preparing this kind of message, I could not be preaching the way that I am trying right now without having practiced and trying to live it most of my life. Peter writes, similarly in 1 Peter 2, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. And here it is, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Amen. They say that high blood pressure and all kinds of other diseases are caused by stress. In this country, so many people are sick and so many are stressed. They're stressed out, Christians included. 
but research has found that stress is not related because of big things. Stress is accumulated because of small things, such as not being able to locate your car keys, not being able to find your glasses, somebody who cuts in front of you, someone at a shopping mall taking your parking spot. These little things get us, we have a short fuse. It is not talking about the long term in terms, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in my future. These kinds of long term things, it is because of small everyday little things that cause us stress and make our blood boil, these anxiety-related diseases. Everyone is so being consumed with their rights to the point where if you get in someone's way, if looks can kill, in fact, they do kill literally if you get in their way. It is scary to be alive in this world today because you do not know what people are going to do. You cannot do anything these days. It is almost living in the times of Jesus where the Pharisees put on so many rules and regulations. We do not even know what to do these days. We can't say this. We can't say that. We can't do this. We can't do that. Because if you do this, someone on this side is going to be offended. If you do something here, a person on this side will be offended. You try to open a door at a mall or somewhere for a lady to come out, a woman, you hold the door and they might say to you, are you doing that because I am a lady or woman? She says, no, I'm doing it because I'm a gentleman. We don't even know what to do these days. Should we just let them do everything? I'm not just talking about the female gender. I'm talking about everybody. Are we supposed to bow? Are we supposed to just say, hey, bro, how are you doing? A lot of people these days say, hey, bro. I don't know what that means. People go around talking about all kinds of stuff, greeting people. When I was growing up, I used just to do this a lot, and they thought, what's wrong with your neck? You know? And I was saying hello. So I, then I started going the other way. I, I would see them, and it was just kind of small little acknowledgement. We don't know what to do these days. All I know is that we have a commonness as believers, as different as we are. We all come from different places. We all look different, and we have different interests. We have all kinds of things that make us who we are, but the one common thing that we have is the Word of God. When we come to the Word of God, worshiping the living God and learning from His Holy Word, that, that unites us. That unites us, not anything else. Amen. But Christians respond entirely differently, entirely differently from the world. For in verse 15, we are told to rejoice with those who rejoice. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And in 12th chapter where we are, Romans verse 15, weep with those who weep. It is also distinctly Christian to be sympathetic. Love, not retaliating, is distinctly Christian, but also to be sympathetic. When someone is weeping, you weep with them. The world is becoming more and more callous, more indifferent. They don't care. That is why we see so many murdering, killing, and all kinds of evil going on, and it really does not hit us anymore. At first, we thought, horrendous, how terrible were the comments that came out of our mouths. But it's like, it happens every day. That is why when you watch a movie, when you had a car chase, you need to have two car chases. If you had things blowing up. You got to have a few more of those. You got to have people killing each other and cursing and all kinds of stuff. It gets worse and worse and worse, worse and worse. And that's exactly the way the world is. To weep is to shed tears. They say that men are less sensitive, therefore men do not cry. I, to a large degree, I agree. On an average, women live five years at least more than men. That's because psychologists and physiologists all figured out that it is the tears that make us release of our stress. And when people cry, it relieves them. But when you bottle things in, like men have to show their manliness, and even though they may want to cry, 
Ever since we were like five years old, maybe even younger, our parents and everybody around us told us, hey, you are a man, you are a boy, boys don't cry. So we grow up, when we become married, we don't even know how to shed a tear. We are to be marked as those who are very sensitive to those around us. I've always been, shall I say, I cried a lot growing up. I don't know for what reason, very sensitive as a little boy. Growing up, becoming an adult, not so much, but still. When I would hear God's word, I would tear. No exception. In that sense, I was in tune with God, very sensitive, and I would receive so much blessing realizing that I'm a sinner, and yet God would give me so much grace. And over the years, my eyes have become somewhat dry. But these days, not ashamed to say, just watching anything, someone crying, even thinking about or talking about crying, I too water. It's just incredible how my hormones have changed over the years. We are to laugh, not because we are supposed to artificially, but with thankfulness that they should be blessed. We are so, so caught up with the idea that someone else should be blessed that we are so happy we cannot even restrain our joy. Those who have cause for rejoicing, we fully enter into their joy. Likewise, we are to share in the tears of a friend, of a fellow member of the body of Christ. This too is uniquely Christian. In an ever-increasingly indifferent, insensitive world, sharing a tear or two with somebody in their sadness is absolutely Christian. This is exactly what you and I need to be doing. Remember the prophet Jeremiah? He had a whole life of weeping. He is known as the weeping prophet. In Jeremiah 15, 16, we hear these words, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. God's words are sweeter than honey. Jeremiah ate his words. You know, there are many ways to read the word of God. You can read with your eyes. You can read with your mouth. You can write the words, you can type the words, you can rip the pages out of the Bible, crumble them, and eat, literally. I don't know what that would do, but the idea is that they want to eat the Word of God, digest the Word of God. Jeremiah, he ate the Word of God. He was the delight of his heart. But in Jeremiah 9, verse 1, is what we read, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He wished himself to be a fountain of water because the nation of Israel was living in sin, in order that he could weep night and day to pour out the anguish for those perishing. That was his heart. He wanted to rejoice in the Lord, but he could not do so fully because he was so anguished by the people around him, the nation of people. You and I all face in a minimal way persecution, whether it is for the cause of Christ or in a very earthly way, but you and I are persecuted in some way. But another part of the general behavior Toward all people is in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Even though you will have persecution of some sort, it says, live in harmony with one another. In the New American Standard, the rendering there is, be of the same mind toward one another. So living with harmony is to have one mind toward one another. It is to think about everyone the same. It is to think of everybody the same. It is to treat everyone equally. And this too is unnatural. We have a tendency to go after and kiss up to the one who is rich and famous. That's just a natural way. But we must not play up to certain kinds of people. We must not plan our strategy to reach the elite level of people, these people who are influential, these powerful people. That is why we are told in Philippians chapter 2, So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, 
any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Amen. It is so easy to become social climbers. You heard of mountain climbers. It is so easy for us to be social climbers because we want to be where other important people are. We want to find ourselves around the rich and famous and the popular and the mighty. But that is not a distinctively Christian. Distinct Christianity desires to treat everyone the same. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul says, I appeal to you, all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you. There should be no cliques at cross point. There ought to be no social strata, but that you be perfectly knitting together in the same mind. Let us not have anybody leave the church. They may leave the church because they have to move. They may leave the church because... To them, the style of preaching may not to be their liking. They may leave because they cannot find a parking space. They may leave because the worship service is too early at 9.30. But may they never leave because there is this lack of unity, one-mindedness, that there is clicks happening all the time, that you exclude people, that you only hang out with those that you can get something from, that you can benefit something from, and you hang out and hang around with those people that are nice to you good to you. And when there's a visitor, when there's someone coming in and not being able to fit in because there's a clique or some kind of a exclusive club, that ought never be. May we err on the side of being too doctrinal. May we err on the side of being too theological. May we be on the side of being too dogmatic. May we never err on the side of having no unity and having cliques that would be absolutely terrible. The Bible is against that, and so we also ought to practice this, that we ought to be knitting together in the same mind. All this flows out of love. All this flows out of humility. And there are two things that will help us to get this. Verse 16, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. In other words, do not think on that which is highly esteemed. Do not think on that which is high people, high position, high things. Don't just try to think about high things, high people, and high position. We ought to be thinking lowly things. How to live in harmony with one another first, as we are told, to associate. That's a word condescend. To condescend is to come down, to be carried away. So do not pursue the high things, but be carried away with people of low estate. Be carried away. A lot of times we can be carried away talking about our family, talking about our pet, talking about our children. We can get carried away talking about sports, NBA finals. We could be carried away talking about our business, our talent, whatever that case, whatever the case might be. But he says we are told to be carried away with people of low situations and circumstances. The word lowly is do not rise above the ground. In other words, get down on the ground with the lowly. Get down on the ground. It does not mean that you ignore those who are high, obviously not. To treat everybody equal, you cannot ignore those who are powerful and mighty and those who are influential and all those people who are prominent. But you do not chase that. You do not concentrate on that. People of low social scale are not necessarily of low level spiritually. A lot of times we think that those without financial means those who are sort of low on the social ladder, we think that spiritually even they are low. A lot of times it's just the opposite. When you are rich and you are wealthy, it is most of the time true that those people who have to manage all that money, all the things that they are so 
in needing to do, a lot of times they neglect the spiritual side. But the one that is so low in terms of not knowing where the next meal is going to come from are so dependent on God. God, I am about to die of starvation. I am about to die. I am dying of thirst. Lord, I need some clothing. I am about to freeze to death. And those who are right with God, who are so dependent on God, are deeply spiritual. So we must not think that those who are lowly in standing are spiritually low also. Secondly, never be conceited. Verse 16 says, never be wise in your own sight, thinking you know everything. And you come across people like that. Perhaps some of you sitting here, you are guilty of this. Maybe you like to come across to people, you even think that you know all things. Never be conceited. Never be wise in your own sight. Proverbs 3, 5 tells us, do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. The earlier part of that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all things, consider him and he will show you your path. Do not lean on your own understanding. Again, what do we have in common at our church? I want you to get this. We stand for the word of God. That is our common ground. We are one in Christ around the Savior. Ministry is not social oriented. We may not have all the social things at this church and in this ministry. We may not have activities. We may not have all those things that other churches have. We don't have all the bling bling things that's going on and all kinds of fancy stuff. We may not have all that. But it is spiritually and biblically oriented and that we are striving to maintain. The next verses have to do with another final circle that is widening one final time, and that has to do with personal enemies. I'm going to save that for next week. Spirit, touch your church. Stir the hearts of men. Revive us, Lord, with your passion once again. I want to care. For others, like Jesus cares for me, let your rain.